As the war between Russia and Ukraine rolls into its third year, the, the carnage on the battlefield continues uh, at a pace. And off the battlefield, the propaganda war, I think, is probably the most polite thing you can say about it. It seems to continue also to be going, especially in Kiev, in Brussels, uh, London, Washington, especially. All kinds of fiction going on around there. And as we always do on this channel, we want to get down to the brass tacks. What's the reality on the ground? Despite what anybody wants to say, what anybody hopes, it's the reality on the ground is what makes all the difference in the world. And there is none better to unpack this than the amazing rock star of a, of a, a celebrity, according to some of our viewers, John Mearsheimer. John, welcome back to the show. Glad to be here, Danny. Well, listen, it's, I, I keep thinking that, that it's just, it can't get any crazier than, than what we've seen up to this point, because there's been so many just nonsense of things said by some people is just in blatant disregard to, to what's observable on the ground. And I'll be darned if yesterday we weren't surprised that there was in fact something new. Uh, I'm going to sh first show you a, a clip from a, an interview that I believe Brett Baer did with Zelensky back in February. Uh, and, and one of the things he says in this interview didn't get a lot of attention at the moment because I think people just said, well, that's just wishful thinking. Uh, but he talks about setting up the potential for another offensive. What ch Check the clip out. Uh, to continue our successful story on the Black Sea, and we will do it. I will not now go deeply to details, but they will get some surprises. I mean, Russians. Yeah, that's very important. So South is very important to defend East, where they have more than 200,000 soldiers, also very important to defend. And of course, we will prepare new counteroffensive, new operation. And of course, it's not, I'm, I'm not speaking that we will just stay. Of course, it depends, depends on a lot of things. Well, apparently, one of the things it depended on was the passage of time because uh, yesterday Newsweek is reporting that, in fact, Zelensky confirms plans for a new Ukrainian counteroffensive. Now, how in the world he plans to do this, I have no earthly idea. I, I was actually shocked about this because uh, right now, all along the line of contact, Ukraine is being driven back everywhere. They, they aren't having success anywhere. And by success, I mean even holding the line. There's not even a stalemate. They are physically being pushed back all along the line of contact, uh, in, enduring enormous amounts of casualties everywhere. And I just can't think in what planet, in what reality can someone say that now then they're going to go on the offensive when presently they don't even have enough reserves to stop a defensive? Well, I agree with that, but I would add two points. One is they may be making this argument, uh, Zelensky and company, uh, to convince the West that they're still in fighting shape and therefore the West should support them. Uh, this may be the main reason they're doing this because it's obviously not going to happen on the battlefield. But let's assume I'm wrong, and this gets to my second point. If the Ukrainians were to launch another counteroffensive, it would have disastrous consequences and it would bring the war to a quicker end than if the Ukrainians remained on the defensive. That's that's a pretty heady statement there. Now, I, I think I understand why. I just wonder if you can explain to our viewers why you think it could bring it to a quicker end and probably not the one that Zelensky would uh, desire. When you're in a war of attrition where firepower really matters, it's best to be on the defensive and be in a hole in the ground so you minimize the chances you will get killed. If you go on the offensive, you have to get out of that hole, that foxhole or that bunker. You have to get out into the open and you have to run across an open field. And that exposes you to enemy fire and you die in large numbers. So it makes eminently good sense if you're in Ukraine's position to remain in the ground, to remain in holes, to remain on the defensive and not to get out of the ground and charge against uh, enemy fire, uh, as they did last year when they launched the counteroffensive uh, on June 4th and suffered enormous casualties. You know, it's ironic that my, my boss at Defense Priorities, uh, where I'm a senior fellow, actually made that argument last year. He said, I just don't understand why they want to go on the offensive because they'll die in larger numbers, but they have, you know, defensive positions here. And at the moment, Russia was just in their own defensive positions and not in a position to launch an attack. 
Uh, so he said, you know, they could have preserved a lot of fire uh, manpower then, which is irreplaceable. I, I want to point out uh, whatever the numbers that they've lost. And, and it's variously in the, the many dozens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. And we'll probably never know until years after the war's over what the numbers really were. But whatever it is, it's a massive number. And those are people who had been trained up to some degree uh, through eight years of the 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 long, you know, almost trench warfare that happened before 2022 and all the training that was done, the experience they had, almost all of those were killed off. And so now then you're talking about a new batch uh, that have almost no experience at all. And after you've lost all of your good fighters, the, the idea now that you could go on the offensive just seems preposterous at every level. Well, two additional points, and this is, of course, not to disagree with you, it's not only that they have a problem with manpower, they have a significant problem with weaponry. They're short of artillery tubes, they're short of artillery shells, they're short of air defense systems. They're in terrible shape in terms of weaponry as well as manpower. Uh, and then the other point uh, that you've emphasized uh, many times is you just don't train an army up to take the offensive, even to remain on the defensive in a few weeks time. It, it takes many months, if not years, uh, to train up an army that is a formidable fighting force. And we trained up the Ukrainians last year or for last year's offensive, the June 4 counteroffensive, but they were not well enough trained up by any means to successfully pull off that counteroffensive. As again, you have pointed out, I have pointed out, and many others have pointed out. So the idea that they could train up another army that's anywhere near as good uh, as the army that they had last year is out of the question. It just can't happen. They can't train up an army that's as good as last year's Ukrainian army. And last year's Ukrainian army failed abysmally. You want to remember that they didn't even get to the first line of right. Russian defenses. Almost all of the fighting took place in the gray zone, that gray area out in front of the Suravikan line, which was the first line of Russian defense. There was no way they were ever going to penetrate through those multiple lines of defenses that the Russians had put in place. So it was hopeless last year, and it's even worse this year. So to talk about launching a counteroffensive again is just delusional. Well, and, and here's what compounds the problem for me and why it's uh, I'm on, on the one hand, I, I just, you know, laugh at how ridiculous it is, but, but I can't laugh very long because of the very real human carnage that results from this. And, you know, we keep saying over and over at the, especially at the national level that we care about Ukraine and we want their, you know, democracy to flourish and we don't want you uh, Russia to win and all this kind of nonsense. But then you have our senior most defense officials, state department officials, and even the president on occasion, uh, just tying us to things that don't make any sense in light of all those realities you just mentioned here, which are virtually irrefutable. Here's a couple of examples. First, I want to show you uh, uh, Secretary Austin, the Secretary of Defense, uh, talking, uh, I believe it was just last month at a, at a defense forum where people were supposed to give a lot of uh, Western people were supposed to give a lot of more weapons and ammunition for Ukraine. Here's what Austin said. Ukraine won't back down and neither will the United States. The United States will not let Ukraine fail. Just last week, the United States announced additional security assistance for Ukraine valued at $300 million. This is an extraordinary measure to support Ukraine's most pressing needs for air defense, artillery, and anti-tank capabilities. We were only able to support this much needed, uh, much needed package by identifying some unanticipated contract savings. Okay, Ukraine won't fail and we won't let them fail. We're, we're going to continue on. And then he talks about 300 million. John, you can't even say that's a drop in the bucket. 300 million in this context isn't big enough to con constitute a drop, especially when he was talking about those many categories. You, you literally get a handful of whatever in any direction. And that's not enough to, to even have a tactical influence in one spot on the map. So just on the surface, I just don't understand why the Secretary of Defense makes these kinds of statements that can't be fulfilled in reality. Well, if you listen to the Secretary of Defense, and he's not the only one, but if you listen to high-level officials in the Biden administration talk about Ukraine and also talk about Gaza, they often make arguments that 
make no sense. Uh, and you sort of scratch your head and you say, what are these people thinking? Uh, and this is just another example of that. Giving them $300 million worth of equipment that we've scrounged up is not going to make any difference at all. Uh, the Ukrainians are doomed. And as you pointed out quite correctly, the end result of this is massive numbers of Ukrainians are dying. And you want to understand that if you read the media, uh, the Ukrainian media and the Western media talking about the demographic situation uh, inside of Ukraine, uh, you often see the phrase, or I should say you occasionally see the phrase, that Ukraine is in a demographic death spiral. Just think about those words. Ukraine is in a demographic death spiral. And when you take into consideration all of the Ukrainians who have died over the past two plus years on the battlefield, and you look at their demographic situation, that leads me to one conclusion. It's time to shut this war down and prevent more Ukrainian deaths. But instead, what the Americans are encouraging the Ukrainians to do, and what Zelensky and company seem to want to do, is to continue the fight, thinking that they're going to win. They're not going to win. They're going to lose. And many more Ukrainians are going to die. And in my opinion, this is a tragedy. Uh, and, and you might even add travesty as well. And, and that is, I, I guess, profoundly demonstrated uh, by what Secretary Blinken said a week ago, which I... I, I Again, I, I just can't imagine why these words are coming out. By every account that's that's realistic, uh, it was NATO coming into Ukraine and the threat of NATO coming onto the border uh, in Ukraine up to the Russian border, which prompted Russia to act. And they have said nothing but that since 2007 and repeatedly so. Uh, and, and all during this war, they keep saying that same thing, that a neutral Ukraine is gonna is something that could end the war or could have prevented it from starting. Is yes, I think you and I've talked about on a previous episode. And yet, despite all of that, you still have Secretary Blinken just saying this head shaker. Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership uh, and uh, to create a clear pathway for uh, for Ukraine. Uh, moving forward. Uh, we will see, I think, in the summit, uh, very strong support for Ukraine going forward and its relationship with uh, with NATO. I, I mean, John, what what planet is he on? That NATO is going to have strong support to, to add Ukraine into the alliance? I, I mean, by our own administrative requirements, our own laws, meaning NATO's laws, you have to have all internal disputes resolved and you have to have all border disputes resolved. There's a kind of this thing called a full scale war going on, not really resolved. So in the as far as any eye can see in any direction, none of those things are going to be done. So why keep that fiction alive when you know it's just like oil or sand in, in the wound to Russia or maybe more accurately, a red cape in front of a bull that says, yeah, you should keep fighting. Yeah, well, it is a red cape in front of a bull. That's the worst part of it all. Uh, the fact that. Uh, Blinken is delusional or uh, Austin is delusional. That uh, doesn't matter that much. What really matters here is the consequences for the Ukrainian people. Uh, you're basically telling the Russians uh, that they should not only to continue not only continue fighting, but uh, they should make sure they maximize the amount of Ukrainian territory they take number one. And number two, that they go to great lengths to turn Ukraine into a dysfunctional rump state, really wreck Ukraine so that it can't become part of NATO. The much smarter strategy, as you and I have talked about, would be to cut a deal now with the Russians and create a neutral Ukraine so that Ukraine loses less territory and fewer Ukrainians die. But we're going in the opposite direction. And it's not simply because of the Tony Blinkens and the Joe Bidens of the world. It's also because of the Ukrainian leadership, uh, President Zelensky being uh, the most obvious example of that. Yeah, and and uh, we're going to get in a minute to to uh, this the the I guess the sheet of those who 
or delusional is going to spread here in just a minute. But one of the more curious things to me, and, and we see this uh, maybe even to a greater extent in, in our, the United States relationship with Israel and its war down there and how we seem to have just handed all control over to the prime minister of Israel for major strategic decisions. Uh, we'll touch that on another day. But in this case, we have a similar dynamic play out. Here's something that Kirby said, uh, relative, I guess it was last year, late last year, uh, in relation to the to who's calling the shots here. And I just find this strange because I've never seen anything that changes this. We all want to see this war end, but it's got to end on terms that President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people can accept. We want to help them succeed on the battlefield so that if and when President Zelensky and only President Zelensky can determine when it's time to sit down with, with President Putin. And and why why only President Zelensky? Why not U.S. say, OK, our interests also matter. It's our weapons, our ammunition, our defense stockpiles and our potentials getting dragged into a war by either mistake or miscalculation. We're going to end this by requiring a negotiated settlement. Why, why is that not even on the table? Well, the fact is that Kirby is speaking nonsense. The fact is the United States of America is not going to let Ukraine alone determine the course of this war. And in fact, if anybody's going to end up in the driver's seat, it's going to be us, not them. Uh, I, I don't know why he said what he just said, but it's just not the way great power politics works. And a great power like the United States is not going to put its fate in the hands of President Zelensky. Uh, we're going to pay attention to what Zelensky wants, and, and that's appropriate. Uh, I don't dispute that for one second, but uh, the United States will go to great lengths to make sure it gets an outcome that it wants. Uh, the problem that we face here is the leaders uh, uh, in the United States, the people who are in charge of foreign policy, President Biden, uh, uh, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, they basically never took a course in strategy 101, or if they did take a course in strategy 101, they failed it and they didn't go back and retake the course. Well, we need to send it back for remedial training, Professor, because I think you can probably do that. But I digress. Please continue on. <laughs> no, I, I think that for the most part, they just don't know what they're doing. And I think this is true in Gaza. And I think it's true in Ukraine. And uh, we, I believe, will end up suffering devastating defeats, both in Ukraine uh, and in the Middle East, uh, because we do not know what we're doing. And when I say we, I'm talking about the people who are driving the train. It's really quite amazing. It, it really is. And, and it's also ironic that, OK, so that was, I believe, September 2023 that uh, that Kirby made that statement, implying that we want to help Ukraine so that they can make a negotiated settlement from a position of strength. That is nonsense as well, because we had that opportunity. I can argue in, in, in uh, March, April of 2022 at Istanbul, that was the best one, but it wasn't the only one. There was another one in November of 2022 that uh, you've cited this before, where uh, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, uh, actually said, folks, this is the best chance you're going to get. Here's how he put it back then. The probability of a Ukrainian military victory defined as kicking the Russians out of all of Ukraine to include what they define or what they claim as Crimea, to the probability of that happening anytime soon is not high militarily. Politically, there may be a political solution where politically the Russians withdraw. That's possible. You want to negotiate from a position of strength. Russia right now is on its back. The Russian military is suffering tremendously. Leaders have been, uh, you know, the leadership is, is really hurting bad. They've lost a lot of casualties, killed and wounded. They've lost, uh, I won't go over exact numbers because they're, they're classified, but they've lost a tremendous amount of their tanks and their infantry fighting vehicles. They've lost a lot of their fourth and fifth generation fighters and, and helicopters and so on and so forth. The Russian military is really hurting bad. So you want to negotiate at a time when you're at your strength and your opponent is at weakness. And it's possible, maybe, that there'll be a political solution. All I'm, all I'm saying is there's a possibility for it. That's all I'm saying. 
And as it turned out, there would never be a better moment then because Russia truly was. They had just been kicked out of Kyrgyzstan City. Uh, they had been driven back in the Kharkiv area. They had just mobilized 300,000 people, and they're literally throwing untrained people into the gap to try and stop the bleeding. They were at their weakest point there, and Ukraine was at its high watermark. If they had ever any thought of negotiating from a position of strength, John, that was it. Absolutely. There's no question that Millie was right on the money. Uh, and, uh, of course, the uh, leadership in the White House uh, and in the State Department, here we're talking about Blinken, Sullivan, and Biden, uh, didn't agree with Milley. And they thought we had the Russians down and it wouldn't take much to knock them out. I think we were still uh, thinking that the sanctions would work soon and bring the Russians to their knees because we choked their economy. Uh, I think that we believe that the Ukrainians with our backing would become more formidable fighting forces on the battlefield. And then there were lots of people then, and still there's some of them running around who constantly talk about how incompetent the Russians are uh, and uh, how they can't do anything on the battlefield of any real consequence. And this is simply wrong. All armies learn. The Russian army has learned. And furthermore, it's expanded greatly in size. Uh, so, and I think Milley anticipated that. I would imagine that the intelligence that Milley was getting told him what would happen in all likelihood uh, in 2023 and 2024, and he put two and two together, and he saw that this was the high water mark, and said, "Let's cut a deal now." Uh, but a lot of other people, uh, especially the civilians, thought that that was not true, and they were wrong. And the end result is Ukraine is going to be defeated. And if I if I'm not mistaken, I believe the number of troops that Russia had in Ukraine uh, at that moment in November 2022. Uh, was somewhere south of 200,000. That, that's that's my recollection because they started off with barely 200,000 total and, and they didn't put them all in at the same time. And they had lost a lot of people in the in the first you know eight or nine months of that war. But now then, today, it's somewhere north of 600,000 in Ukraine. And according to recent reports and in Western intelligence, the, there's another grouping of about 120,000 Russian forces that have trained, I think it's six combat divisions that have been training out of contact based on lessons that they had learned to your point a second ago that are very fresh. And so if there is a breakthrough somewhere along the line, they actually have something at a strategic level to exploit it. That's the big risk right now, I think. Yeah. You want to remember, as you said, that the Russians in the fall of 2022, this is the first year of the war, they mobilized, Putin mobilized 300,000 troops. Then over the course of 2023, they didn't mobilize any more, but 495,000 troops were formed, or 495,000 Russians either enlisted or signed contracts to come into the Russian army. So the Russian army increased by another 495,000 in 2023. And this year, 2024, all the reports are they're getting 30 plus thousand volunteers a month. So wow. their army is Every growing month. in size. And you don't want to lose sight of the fact that what matters here is not just the Russian size, but the Ukrainian size. And the Ukrainian army is shrinking and they can't put a mobilization plan in place that can raise enough troops to replace all of those troops who have died or are going to die on the battlefield. So the balance of troops, not to mention the balance of weaponry, is shifting more and more towards the Russians, and it's already decisively in the Russians' favor. Right. And and we're actually going to touch on that here in just a minute when you're going to compare the ability of the two sides to sustain combat power over time. Russia right now, as of results uh, or uh, reports from uh, two months ago, I haven't seen the, the most updated one, is that Russia is, is on pace to produce about 250,000 artillery shells 
per month, the 152 caliber that they use in, in their, their weapon systems. Uh, that is a huge number because that allows you to sustain large number of, of strikes for a long time. And of course, that's on top of their FAB bombs, uh, their, their missile inventory, which everyone talked about was going to run out sometime in the summer of 2022 and somehow is still having these huge barrages like last night. Uh, they continue to decimate the the energy infrastructure, which even further damages Ukraine's ability to build stuff. But you're going to see some pretty stark, I mean, shockingly stark uh, contradictions between the two sides. I'll get to it in just a second. Uh, but the, the one thing I want to ask you, though, is as best you can understand, what is the play of both Zelensky personally and the West at large? All of these things you mentioned, like like with with uh, uh, Secretary General Milley in 2022, they have the the raw intel. They've got the knowledge of all the things that you say out loud. They know probably more than you or I both know, and yeah. all of it is in a negative direction. Why then make this claim that they're going to have an offensive for Zelensky, and why keep this fiction of NATO and all this stuff when it can never be realized, and all it can do is set the stage for a complete literal defeat. Well, I think it's propaganda, and it's propaganda that's designed uh, to give the Ukrainians hope, uh, to convince the West that it should continue to support Ukraine, that we shouldn't quit, uh, that we shouldn't adopt the ideas of Danny Davis and John Mearsheimer, which is that now's the time for a settlement, and the Ukrainians just have to accept the fact that they're going to lose some territory and they have to become a neutral state. Uh, they're cutting against that as well. Uh, but my argument is that this is delusional and it's not in Ukraine's interest or, uh, or America's interest. And what we should do is recognize reality here and act according to what the situation on the ground really is not what it is in these fantasies that they're spinning uh, in this massive propaganda campaign that they're engaged in. And But I, I'm, I'm trying to cut through the, the difference between wishing for an outcome and desiring one and being afraid of a certain outcome here, which I certainly understand. I mean, I do get that, that, that nobody in Ukraine wants to lose the war. Nobody in the West wants Russia to win the war. I get that completely. But the the fundamentals that you've just outlined here are irrefutable and and, and non negotiable. They're going to head this way if we don't follow that Mearsheimer plan you just mentioned, and instead they go on the fiction one. I mean, I mean, there is no hope to have. Uh, all you're doing is literally setting more people up to die and then utterly fail catastrophically. I, I just can't understand why you would keep the fiction of hope when I hope you know inside it can't succeed? Or is there some master plan I'm not aware of? <laughs> well, if there is a master plan uh, and you've been unable to figure it out, I want to say that I've also been unable to figure it out. And I've been unable to find anybody who can tell me what the master plan is. And when you ask people who are in the know, who uh, are either in the administration or talk to people who are in the administration, what's going on here, all they do is give you a lot of gobbledygook and they evade the hard facts. If you and I were to go, you know, up against Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan and make our argument and lay out all the hard, cold facts, uh, they would not be able to refute them, as you say. They're just facts. Facts are facts. And uh, they would in effect, I believe, dance around the issue and they would make all sorts of arguments that were designed to dodge the questions that we pose to them. But that's where we are. And again, this is why the United States is in so much trouble around the world today, because it does not, uh, it does not act in a way that accords with reality. It's uh, really hard to believe, but true. Yeah. I, I want to hope that one of the, one of the plausible uh, theories that I hear a lot of people point out is that a lot of money's involved here, a lot of cash. And Gary, yeah, Gary puts this up a lot. You see here where uh, this was in December uh, when Zelensky met with all of these senior execs from Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, all, all the big defense contractors uh, who are all smiling gleefully at the contracts that they're going to be getting because of this. So the longer the war goes, the happier every one of those people is there. And I certainly get that, but one would at least hope 
that that's not really the driver that they want to keep this going as long as they can. So they need that fiction because otherwise if they adopt the Mearsheimer plan, then the war could be over within weeks from now, frankly, at, at, at least the fighting could stop very quickly if we adopt that plan and the dying could stop. But one hopes that it's not that simple. Well, I, I actually don't put much stock in the, let's call it the military industrial complex argument that what's fueling this uh, war and, preventing us from ending it is the fact that you have this MIC, this military industrial complex that wants to just keep selling weapons and therefore they want to keep the war going. I don't put much stock in that argument. I think if anything, it's the fact that these leaders, uh, certainly Zelensky, but also Biden, Sullivan and Blinken are heavily invested in this war. Their reputations are on the line. And they don't want to lose. They're desperate to find a way to win because of the damage it will do to their reputations. There's one other very important dimension to this, Danny, that you want to uh, keep in mind. And that is, at some point, when Ukraine loses, the question is going to come to the fore. Who has blood on his or her hands? In other words, who is responsible for this fiasco? And I believe that if Ukraine loses, we're not able to pull a rabbit out of a hat. People who have been in charge of American foreign policy since President Biden moved into the White House are going to have a lot of blood on their hands. And that's going to be obvious to people. So what they want to do is they want to figure out a way. They're desperate to figure out a way to turn things around. They just trying and trying. They're kicking the can down the road for the moment, hoping that there'll be some magic formula that suddenly appears. Because again, their reputations are on the line. And the whole question of who has blood on his or her hands really is going to matter. And they know. Yeah, it definitely is. And, and I assure you that question will be asked and answers will be uh, put forward. But it seems to me probably the best, most likely uh I guess manifestation of what you said, looking for a rabbit out of their hat is that they're hoping against hope that this $60 billion from Congress can somehow get shaken out. And there was the, uh, the commanding general of, I believe CENTCOM, uh, general Cavoli was testifying before Congress yesterday and was specifically asked about this situation and what's going on and what the situation is. And well, uh, let me let uh, general Cavoli tell it. There's several little clips here. I want to play here and get your uh, commentary on, on each one of them. Here's the first one. Moreover, Russia is turning to the People's Republic of China, Iran, and North Korea to sustain its campaign in Ukraine. These countries are forming interlocking strategic partnerships in an attempt to challenge the existing order. This is profoundly inimical to U.S. national interests. Okay, on that point, I can agree with him. That is inimical to our uh, income, I mean, to our security. But no one asked the question, why are we in this situation? Why is Russia, China... Iran and North Korea, why are they working closer today than they ever have before? Because of our policy. We caused this situation. It's quite remarkable. Who has driven the Chinese and the Russians into bed together? It's the United States of America. Here we have a peer competitor to deal with in the international system. It's China. China is the most serious threat to the United States. Russia is not a serious threat to the United States. The United States should have very good relations with Russia. With Russia. We should not be driving the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. We have done that. We've driven the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and the North Koreans closer together. It's now much more difficult to deal with the North Korean nuclear problem than it was in the past because the Russians and the Chinese now have a vested interest in helping North Korea against us. And the same basic logic applies to Iran, where we want to go to great lengths to keep Iran from getting nuclear weapons, number one, and from causing more trouble in the Middle East. But if you look at what's happening, the Iranians are closer than ever to the Russians and the Chinese, who will protect them and help them if they get into a conflict with the United States. So the problem that General Cavoli describes is absolutely correct. But what he's missing is that we created this mess. Okay. So let me ask you from your, your international relations theorist hat uh, that you wear so well, 
let's look forward a little. Let, let's project and let, let's say that uh, your analysis and assessment of, of where the war is going to end up uh, is accurate and that Russia, we either belatedly go and seek a negotiated settlement, something that's definitely uh, would be in, in Moscow's favor, or if we don't and, and they the army collapses and you have an Afghan style disaster like in uh, August of 2021 where everything collapses and then here comes Russia and they just outright win. What is that going to do to the international system that we built since the Second World War, uh, especially if everybody sees that the cumulative West lost and everything they tried to do did not defeat Russia? Russia won. Now then this this coalescing around China, Russia, North Korea and Iran. What happens to that coalition? Well, if the when the war ends, you won't get a meaningful peace agreement. Right. What you'll get is a frozen conflict in all likelihood. I, I find it almost impossible to imagine us negotiating a peace agreement where everybody lives happily ever after. You're going to get a frozen conflict. And we in the West, with the Ukrainians, are going to go to great lengths to undermine Russia's position in the areas of mm. Ukraine that it annexed. The Russians, on the other hand, are going to go to great lengths to precipitate and facilitate fissures inside of Europe, and they're going to go to great lengths to put uh, to cause trouble in transatlantic relations. They're going to try and undermine the West. So there's going to be, in the wake of a frozen conflict, there's going to be an intense security competition between the West and Ukraine on one side and Russia on the other side. This is not going away. Furthermore, you want to realize that there are five different focal points in Eastern Europe, where this one can blow up again on us. One is the Black Sea. There could be a conflict in the Black Sea. Two, there could be a conflict over Moldova. Three, and this is very important, there could be a conflict uh, over Belarus. Uh, what's going to happen when Lukashenko uh, loses power? Are we going to try and foster a color revolution there? Oh, boy. Four is the Baltic which is now surrounded by NATO states. It looks like a Baltic uh, NATO lake. And then fifth, and very important, is the Arctic. There are eight countries in the Arctic. Seven of, them, seven of them are members of NATO. The only one that isn't is Russia. The potential for conflict up there is very great. So I would argue that once the Ukraine war comes to an end and you have a frozen conflict, you're still going to have huge trouble involving the Russians and uh, the West. And this is going to have serious potential for escalation and for turning into a hot war again. And of course, the Russians and the Chinese are going to remain friendly. You know, I was just talking about the fact that only seven, uh, that seven of the eight countries in the Arctic are NATO countries. The only one that isn't is Russia. Well, the Russians have now invited the Chinese. The Russians are now working with the Chinese in the Arctic. For a long time, the Russians did not want to involve the Chinese in the Arctic. But given that they're outnumbered seven to one up there, the Russians are bringing the Chinese with them up into the Arctic. So you can see that the Russians and the Chinese will remain friendly. The Iranians and the North Koreans will remain friendly with the Russians and the Chinese. And there is no end in sight to all the trouble that we are now in. Man, John, that that, that may be the most profound implications of this war I, I, I truly hadn't even thought of that, which is why we love having your international theorist uh, mind here on the show. <laughs> but I mean, I think you can argue that things now we've opened Pandora's box and it's impossible to close it back now. And we're already going to be paying for probably decades to come for, for this foolishness that we started here when we could have prevented the war from starting at the beginning. Yes. I just want to say, just to jump in quickly here, if you go back to April, 2008, when we made the decision to bring Ukraine into NATO, we set and trained a disastrous set of policy consequences. And we are going to live with these consequences for a long time to come. Again, disastrous consequences. That decision was remarkably foolish. Remarkably foolish. If we had not decided to bring Ukraine into NATO, 
it's very important to understand this. Ukraine would be intact today. I believe that Crimea would still be part of Ukraine. And yeah. we wouldn't have all of these problems in Eastern Europe that we now have. And the Every United bit of it spawned after, after the, the, the so-called color revolution uh, when, when in 2013, 2014. Uh, yeah, all of that happened. The Crimea, the whole issue, every bit of it happened after we supported the overthrow of the legally elected government because we didn't like them because they were pro-Russia. Yeah, well, we were interested in bringing Ukraine into NATO and we were interested in overthrowing the Yanukovych government because we saw it as pro-Russian and we wanted to install a government in uh, Kiev that was pro-American. And this has just led to unending trouble. Indeed, we did. And yeah, getting back to the, uh, the, I guess, the rabbit out of the hat issue. So Cavoldi continued on. Uh, and on the one hand, I think he's trying to say this, all these things as, as evidence of something really positive. But in light of Zelensky's comment about an offensive, let's see if you view it differently. In the past 26 months of this war, the U.S. and our partners have delivered vast amounts of critical munitions and equipment to our Ukrainian colleagues. The SAG-U has facilitated a full range of training to promote unit readiness. We have ensured that Ukraine knows how to use their new equipment and knows how to maintain it. So all of that stuff and, and much more than what he talked about there was done prior to the 2023 summer offensive in June, as you alluded to earlier. And there is not a fraction of anyone even talking about that level of, of stuff now, whether they know how to use it or not. And so he almost lays the foundation for the best that we did a year ago for that offensive was an utter and total failure. By what measure does anybody think that there's even the theoretical possibility that this $60 billion is going to somehow facilitate something that one didn't? It's not. Uh, and uh, again, when you talk about the 60 plus billion dollars, that's for weaponry. Uh, and we don't have enough weaponry on the shelf to give them. So even the money for the weaponry doesn't solve that problem. But that leaves aside the manpower problem, which we talked about before. And the $60 billion has nothing to do with the manpower problem. It's up to the Ukrainians to solve the manpower problem, and they cannot solve the manpower problem. I cannot emphasize that enough. They cannot solve the manpower problem. We cannot solve the weaponry problem. And by the way, Danny, you alluded to this before, but we've not talked much about what's happening uh, in terms of the air war and what the Ukrainians are now suffering from is massive attacks from Russian smart bombs. The Russians, not too long ago, took all of these dumb bombs that they had. They had a huge inventory of dumb bombs, bombs that are not very accurate. And they put kits on them that turned them into smart bombs. That means the Russians can stand off from the battlefield. They don't have to go over the battlefield where they might get shot down. These planes can stand off and they can throw bombs, smart bombs, at Ukrainian forces on the front lines and at in infrastructure and troop concentrations behind the front lines with great precision. They can put those bombs in the pickle barrel. And this is having a devastating effect on the Ukrainian forces. So we talk about the manpower problem, the artillery problem. Now what we should talk about is the air power problem as well. And the end result of all this is the Ukrainian forces are being decimated. And there's nothing we can do about it. And I'm sure, by the way, General Cavoli, who I've followed a bit, is a very smart man. He, he's a very impressive general, and I'm sure he's getting good intelligence, and I'm sure he understands what we're saying, Danny, although he cannot say that publicly because he is part of the administration. And, and here's what he is saying publicly on, on some of these very issues here. He points out there's a math problem. General Cavoli, what would be the consequences for Ukraine, the United States, and NATO if Congress fails to, uh, in a timely manner, pass the supplemental funding bill? Uh, Chairman Rogers, um, you know, I, I, I can't predict the future, but I can, I can do simple math. And when I look at the supply rates, I look at the supply sources, when I look at the consumption rates, um, if we do not continue to support Ukraine, 
Ukraine will run out of artillery shells and will run out of air defense interceptors um, in fairly short order, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, based on my experience in 37 plus years in the US military, if one side can shoot and the other side can't shoot back, the side that can't shoot back loses. Okay, well, it's really hard to argue with that last point there, but what's, what's not stated there is one of the things I keep trying to shine a spotlight on. The implication that if they get $60 billion, that that will redress all of those issues he's talking about, all these math problems. And John, it's not going to change anything. It'll be a little, that $300 million isn't a drop in the bucket. $60 billion is a drop in the bucket, but by itself, it, it, it won't do anything. So all of these math problems he's talking about will still exist after that $60 billion. That's one of the things that frustrates me to no end. To put a finer point on what you just said, which of course I agree with completely, if we don't give them $60 billion plus dollars, they lose. But if we do give them $60 plus billion, they still lose. Well, that's that is a finer point. And and that that's what I want to hear people. I want they, people to understand the 60 billion will not change the outcome. The outcome is is already baked in. It's it's irrevocable in my in my view. It's literally irrevocable. So to give this money uh, is is I think if anything you can say it will potentially slightly delay the outcome will probably result in more hope being given so that they keep fighting longer and meaning more people will die before the end comes but it won't change the outcome. Yeah, in a very important way, what you're saying is that if we give them the aid and encourage them to keep fighting, not only will more Ukrainians die, as you just, <coughs> excuse me, as you just said, but they will lose more territory. So in a very important way, they'd be better off not getting the money and cutting a deal now where they try to get as good a deal as possible, which means as much territory as possible remains uh, on Ukraine's side of the ledger. And the Russians only capture so much territory. And of course, fewer Ukrainians die because we put an end to the war. But in a very important way, it would be better if they didn't get the aid and cut a deal now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a counterintuitive, uh, very real uh, situation that's developing. The last piece I want to show you here really underscores, and I think this can help you people understand why the sixty billion dollars is not going to have any material effect here. Uh, the the general was asked basically, what is the prospect for for this money? What's it going to do? How how is it going to redress, especially the artillery issue? Note what he says here about the Western capacity. Uh, and about the Ukrainian capacity. It's important to note that our allies are increasing their production rates. They're just not able to take it all under their control yet. They just don't have the supplies. They're increasing rapidly. Both NATO and the European Union are working to increase European production. That will be the first part of a bridge to the future. And then, meanwhile, we're all working with Ukraine to increase their organic production rates. They're already producing about 11,000 artillery shells a year and some other things. So we're bringing that up. Uh, I, I actually had to run it back when I first heard that. I'm like, did he say 11,000 per year? Because that's, that's about two days worth of use on the front line. And that's what they produce in a year. Western Europe is, is also, he's talking about going really slow. I've seen the numbers. It's somewhere around 1.2, 1.3 million per year. Whereas Russia, with you with North Korea's help, is somewhere around five million per year. So, with or without sixty billion dollars, there physically isn't the capacity. Even if you've got three hundred billion dollars, it's not a money issue; it's a capacity issue. Yeah, one additional point there. He was talking about uh, the fact that we are trying to go to great lengths to help the Ukrainians build up an industrial base so they can produce a lot of their own artillery shells and artillery tubes and so forth and so on. It's very important to note that the Russians are systematically attacking that infrastructure that's now being built up in Ukraine. And there's going to be hardly any of it left by the end of this coming summer. So the Ukrainians are not going to be able to fill the void. And as you just said, the West Europeans can't fill the void. 
and we can't fill the void. And all of this adds up to the fact that nobody can fill the void. And that's why it doesn't make any difference whether we give them 60 plus billion dollars or not. They're destined to lose. So let's cut a deal now so fewer Ukrainians die and they lose less territory. Now, you, you talked a, a little earlier in this broadcast about, you know, the what we sh- what they should do, the Mearsheimer plan, I call it, because it's it's the one that's that's based on ground truth reality and on trying to limit the damage as much as possible and actually have a future and a hope for Ukraine. What do you think is going to happen? Given all the trajectories we talk about, all these comments you've seen literally from just yesterday and uh, the days before, uh, where do you think this is going to go? I think we'll continue fighting uh, and uh, nobody will buy my argument that we should cut a deal now. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I doubt it. And uh, the end result is at some point, the Russians will have taken all the territory that they think is appropriate. You'll get a frozen conflict. And as I said before, this frozen conflict uh, will uh, lead to an intense security competition between the Russians on one side and the Ukrainians in the West on the other side, with all sorts of potential for things heating up and turning into a hot war again, maybe uh, over Belarus or Moldova, maybe over the Black Sea, maybe over the Baltic Sea, or maybe over the Arctic. But uh, this this story has no happy ending. Uh, and again, we want to keep in mind that the situation in Gaza has no happy ending either. Uh, we've basically blown both these conflicts in terms of managing them in smart ways. It is, yeah, it's it's really just anguishing to contemplate, and and the evidence on the ground, and 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 in capitals around, and the comments and the actions by various leaders, uh, unfortunately, corroborate all of those. And uh, it's hard to see this going anywhere else. Uh, well, John, listen, uh, thanks so much for coming on today. And uh, even though I don't like some of these answers here you're illuminating the reality so that nothing can happen that's going to cause anybody to to be shocked at the end and say oh we never saw this coming because you have seen it coming and you've now laid it out for us all to see here uh folks also i want to let you know before we let john go uh one of the great privileges of my life of of professional life uh, has been that uh, i got to stand next to john at a a, a debate at the center uh, council on foreign relations in new york uh recently uh, that that debate is going to be broadcast uh, tomorrow morning. Actually, it's going to go public, uh, and uh, you, you truly don't want to miss this. It is it is enlightening. Uh, we, we were debating a couple of folks who are on the other side of the question: Should Congress give money to Ukraine? I think you know what our answer is, and uh, <laughs> what we said because John's talked about a lot of it here. There he is, getting mic'd up, getting ready to go on, uh, sort of in the green room backstage. Uh, but uh, this is something that hopefully with this wider audience, because uh, allegedly, according to the event organizers, once this goes on public radio and, and several other venues, it could be seen by as many as uh, 4 million people. So we'll see how that ends up working out. But we also ask you to share this video that we that we just made here, share that video when it comes out, because it'll be on our, we'll tweet that out. Uh, as many people who can know the truth, the better the chances that we have to get this thing shut down so that we can stop the damage and at least have a chance at, at avoiding some of the worst outcomes you're talking about, John, on the other side of an agreement. I agree with you completely. Yeah, and that's that. I, I, that's something I hadn't really thought about. We'll, we'll have to explore that actually some more about the potentials on the other side of this agreement. We've been so focused on the on the battle lines here that uh, I haven't even given as much thought to, as you have about what comes next. But uh, there are some things coming. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, John, for coming on today. And we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.